If you're a candidate running for the city council, you've been invited to speak tonight. I need you to come up to the front right now, and we're going to open our program. It's the policy of the League of Women Voters to start on time and to end on time. If you were late, we apologize. But 7 o'clock is 7 o'clock. As we begin to kind of take order, questions are coming tonight from the audience, and um, no cards are being handed out. If you have a question you would like to ask uh, the panel tonight, you can get a card and write your questions down, and I'll explain how that's going to work in just a minute. Is I wish I was first. I'd come well, then he's, he's going to sit at the end. Either way, we're going to have plenty of room at this table, it appears, tonight. Well, yeah, I apologize. There's some misinformation. We're last. Okay. Well, I don't think the other guy will show up. We haven't heard from him either. We did invite him four times. Commissioner, are you okay? Yeah. All right. Well, then this means I have somewhere to put all my notes. We're just waiting on one. Before we begin, if anybody has any cellular devices, you can record tonight's event. But if you turn the ringer on to vibrator silent so you do not disrupt the audiovisual equipment that's going on in the room. Hector, is Mr. Lopez around? Is he still here? No. All right. Everybody, a portion of tonight's program will be reproduced by means of electrical transcriptions or tape recordings. Welcome, friends and neighbors, to the District 1 debate. My name's Chris Forbrick, and I'm with the League of Women Voters. And I want you all to know that I have been rehearsing that for like two months. You might have hoped tonight for a face for TV, but you're getting a voice for radio, and I hope that's good enough for you all. I want to start by telling you a little story about tonight's venue. This, uh, this place used to be a, um embattled bar that created problems for the neighborhood. And the North Central neighborhood, and Lisa Talley and her group had, have worked to um, to revitalize this part of the neighborhood. And Mr. Lopez, who's our host tonight, um, has donated his space. He, he renovated uh, Prestige Ballroom about two years ago and now does community events here every day. And he's not in the room, but let's give him a round of applause for having us tonight. He donated his space and set everything up um, to the League of Women Voters. So thank you to Mr. Lopez. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that doesn't take um, a position on any candidates in the race. Uh, and so we're inviting everyone here so that we can be honest brokers as we talk door to door, neighbor to neighbor about a vision. The men that have come here today are all running for the city council. In total, six of them uh, were on the ballot. All six were invited, twice by letters and twice by phone call. We did get five RSVPs to attend tonight. Three of them have shown up to talk to you. And so in our two hour period, we're gonna have a few more questions than we expected to ask. This, for the last hundred years, the League has been hosting events throughout the United States. And so tonight's format will follow our same tradition. Questions will be taken from the audience on note cards that you write. A group of, um, of people, one, Cosima Colvin and Glenda Willing from the League of Women Voters, are going to go through your questions this evening to make sure that the questions that are being asked of the candidates can be asked of all of them equally and that the answer is equally beneficial to the audience. So any question directed to a specific candidate will not be asked this evening. Um, what else do I have here? Fumble. Uh, I do want to give some special credit to um, the people from Nowcast SA who have come here today to, um, to film and live stream this event. You'll be able to view this on their Facebook, or on their YouTube website, and we'll be sharing the link 
on the League of Women Voters Facebook page later this evening. Gentlemen, you have two minutes for an opening statement. We'll take them in ballot order. After that, we'll rotate each question so that each of you have an opportunity to answer first and last. At the conclusion, each candidate is going to have a one minute closing. Phyllis Ingram with the League of Women Voters and Madhu will be helping us as we keep time today uh, for our event. You will see a yellow 20 second warning and a red and a red stop. At the stop, I really need you to wrap up your sentence. If you go too long, I'm good to cut you off. We only have one microphone, so it's wireless, and you're going to have to share it. The, the facility had limited AV. Um, candidate and campaigns have been asked not to distribute any material during today's presentation until the event is over, as this event, this venue needs to be cleaned up and turned into, I believe, a wedding reception in the morning, and we just don't want to leave any candidate materials on the floor or that they'd be wasted. It's a hustle to run for office. It's very expensive. We don't want to waste any of the material either. So it'll all be available on the back table. They'll be uh, at the door at the end of the event. You can shake their hand and talk to them there. So, with that, I guess we're going to start with Robert Fadia in your two-minute opening. Don? There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Fedia. I am a labor and community organizer. I work with the teachers of San Antonio. And I'm running for office because I believe that working people need a voice in this city. I'm a working class candidate. I come from a working family. And uh, like most working families out there, I had a hard time growing up. Um, serious uh, medical illnesses, uh, bankruptcy, foreclosure. We had to struggle a lot. And that's not a unique story for the people in this city. It's something we hear about more and more. There's a great economic divide. San Antonio leads on economic inequality. And uh, our, our current city council does not seem to be addressing this. I believe if we want real change in this city, we need regular working people to run for office, to represent the people, and as an organizer, my job is to empower other people to take action. So not only do I want to advocate for other people, but I want to make sure that I'm in the communities educating people on what is happening. I want you to be there right alongside me, fighting for justice for all people of this city. So thank you very much. Mr. Montano. Try to do this without hands. Um, thanks, Chris, and thank you all for hosting this. This is such an amazing event. I'm extremely excited to be here, and I want to begin by recognizing a couple of very special people here with me tonight. My mother, Diana Montano, is here somewhere. Where are you, mom? There in the back. She's shy. Actually, she's not. Um, and then my, of course, my deputy campaign manager and field director, Liz McLeod, another San Antonio native like my like myself, and my grandmother. Uh, Maria Montano, who is going to be 98 years old this year. So she was born, <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause, right? right? <laughs> she was born in 1919, so just a year before the League of Women Voters uh, was founded. And, and all of these women uh, have been you know, inspirations for me as, as I make this run. As I mentioned, I was born and raised here in San Antonio. I was very lucky to get a good education at Central Catholic High School before going on to uh, college at Yale and law school at Stanford, and now I help people start software companies. And I'm running because I really feel like District 1 is being neglected, particularly the neighborhoods. And if you take a look around a neighborhood like this, you see some perfect examples of that. And as somebody who grew up in a particularly disadvantaged part of the city on the southwest side, I know exactly what that feels like to be ignored. And I want to make sure that that changes uh, by being the next council person from here in District 1. Thank you. Mr. Trevino. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm Roberto Trevino. I'm councilman for District 1. Uh, welcome, everybody. And you know, you do remind me with your grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1919 as well. She's no longer with us. I was very close to her myself. I was raised by a single mother. Um, and I think that's important to know because uh, you know, we, do, we are talking about some important things about how, how we are trying to build a city that is really looking out for its community. Uh, I very much have been raised on those exact values. 
uh, you know, one of the things that I think I find is very important is to, to understand how the city works and how it can work for you, but how we can contribute to that actual work as well. So it's important to have a candidate that, that understands that process, understands the, the very people that are, are involved with making the city grow, helping the, the citizens in our community, and helping to really, truly realize the potential of a great city that we all know as San Antonio. I am the only council member here who has been a part of any city committees, any, any kind of effort that understands exactly how a city runs and what it, it takes to get things done in a city. Thank you. All right, guys. The first question is going to go to Mr. Montano. Um, what is your stance on hearing from the people? Does a neighborhood association have a stronger voice than the constituent, and why? Uh, so the question is about individuals versus collectivities, essentially. Um, look, I think that neighborhood associations play an extremely strong role in our neighborhood, in our city. Uh, often they are the, the first place, along with organizations like PTAs and churches, where the rubber of uh, democracy really hits the road. So do I think that neighborhood associations are somehow superior to average constituents? Of course not. Uh, what's awesome about neighborhood associations or churches or PTAs is that they are made up of everyday citizens who take the time to step forward and, and do a little extra for their communities. So uh, I do think that there is a primacy of neighborhoods as a basic organizing unit of the city. But we need to make sure that every voice in the district is heard, uh, irrespective of whether they happen to be a member of a neighborhood association. Mr. Trevino. Thank you. Uh, well, I believe that every voice counts. Uh, there, there is a, there's a place for, for, for so many things. And of course, neighborhood associations, what they provide is, is a way to help disseminate information, have conversation, provide community. And we encourage that as much as possible. Uh, a point in fact is uh, many times when we talk to our constituents, we talk, we ask if they've spoken to the neighborhood association, do they know their neighbors? Um, this is all a part of us all working together as a community. Uh, but we have to realize that, that everybody has a voice in this, in this city, uh, but we, we want to make sure that, that we're all working together at it. Mr. Petty. Yes, I believe that working with our neighborhood associations is extremely important. Um, if you are an individual, I think we should be encouraging more people to get involved because we're facing a changing society where people do not know their neighbors, they do not know who is in their community, and uh, that's really a hindrance to us developing a strong community for San Antonio. So you may say that you know the individual has as much voice as a neighborhood. A neighborhood, if we want a strong neighborhood, should include all those people in it. We should be outreaching to all the people in our community if we want a diverse representation of this city and our neighborhoods whether it's an issue in your neighborhood, whether it's an issue within the district, or all across the city. So let's make sure we reach out to more people to include them in that discussion so that we can have more diverse discussions. Mr. Trevino, District 10 has a, a senior center. District 9 will be getting one soon. When will District 1 receive a full service, multi-service, senior center, and what does that look like? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, actually, we are working to, to supplement the existing senior centers that we have already in District 1. But we're also looking at expanding uh, what it means to have uh, real diversity in, in, in District 1. We're, we're looking at examples like the one I saw over in Houston at the Montrose Center that can help to address uh, senior services for LGBTQ communities. So we are currently looking at uh, expanding senior services throughout the entire district and setting an example for the entire city as a whole. Um, the reality is, is, is that we, we, as District 1 in the center city, we do see a lot of folks coming in to uh, the, the senior centers that are coming from around a, a lot of districts and we hope to expand and grow those. One of the unfortunate issues that we have, for example, at Kenwood is the way it was built. It's, it's difficult to modify, it's difficult to expand, but we're working on, on, on strategies to help improve that. Mr. Bustamante has joined us. He's also running 
for the City Council here in District 1. Mr. Bustamante, the question, if you want to pass that down to him, is District 10 has a senior center. District 9 will be getting a senior center. When will District 1 get a full multi-service senior center, and how does that look? Well, we have several um, senior services. We have one over here uh, behind Walmart off of Vance Jackson. I've been to that one. I think we're members of that, me and my wife. There's also one downtown uh, at the HEB, on the HEB property. Uh, and these are community centers that, that offer benefits to the senior citizens. Um, the, my, my idea of senior of benefits for senior citizens is, is in terms of um, what's called a, a, a smart city concept where we pool our resources uh, with, uh, with companies, with companies like AARP, with community leaders, and we, we uh, open source all this information, put it all together, and then offer the benefits to the citizens. And that's, that's under the uh, uh, smart city concept. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Petty. Thank you. Uh, I visit a lot of uh, Saha senior centers, which are um, not senior centers alone, which is one of the issues we have as well, that these um, house low-income people, they're not strictly for seniors only. Um, and in this case, it's not a benefit for them because uh, obviously our seniors need, have certain needs that need to be addressed. Um, I would like to see a, a senior centers that have activities no matter what time of day, um, open to people whether they are part of that community or live nearby so that they are able to interact with other seniors and um, you know, we've also had a success in pairing senior centers with, with youth. Uh, a lot of seniors like to work with small children and uh, be able to be in the same place as, as them. So I think uh, we can come up with some uh, vibrant ideas to have uh, senior centers out there where seniors can not only get involved, but l meet other people in the community as well. So it needs to be holistic. Mr. Montana. Thank you. Uh, it's a very important question, and uh, I do see the lack and the need and you know just this morning I, I picked up my grandmother from Normoil uh, which is a park on the southwest side that has a true uh, fully functioning full service senior center and I think something bringing something like that to district one would be a top priority and uh, as I've, I've said in the past when I'm council person I will have a, a staff member who is specifically designated to address some of the senior issues we face in this city and it's it's not just building those kinds of facilities it's also making sure that we have accessible transportation uh, to make sure that people can get to those facilities or to church or to the doctor's office. And that might entail rethinking a little bit of how VIA is run and where, uh, what its roots are. Okay, let's uh, bring the microphone back to Mr. Bustamante. So this is gonna start with you. The question is, would you be willing to take the NDO further to disallow religious exemptions on private businesses? The non-discrimination ordinance. Yeah. Yeah, I would support a non-discrimination ordinance. The biggest problem we have with uh, discrimination are the hate crimes. You know, that, that needs to be stopped, it needs to be uh, discouraged, and there has to be stiffer penalties for, for hate crimes. I think that is the most egregious uh, part of uh, any, any type of discrimination against anyone. We all should be equal. Uh, under the Constitution, we have equal rights, uh, and and that goes for all all minorities, and all uh, all those affected. Uh, so, I think it's a matter of um, first first of all is making it safe for people that are discriminated against, and then uh, they should have the same rights that everybody does. And I have to say that the internet and uh, Wi-Fi is a, is a great equalizer. Mr. Padilla. I believe we should be expanding the NDO um, because it's important for us to set a standard in this city that we are a city of human rights and they apply to everyone. We want to be a city of, by, and for the people. Equal rights should apply to all people. Um, 
So we, we, I guess that's really it. That's the, don't really need to go on beyond that. Thank you. Mr. Montano. Uh, yes, I, I would support expanding the NDO to cover all, all businesses in the city. And, and I have to say that we are at a place in our, in our history here in Texas where we are, are being confronted with some odious laws coming down from the state that want to tell us what it means to be a moral society. Uh, and if I'm elected to council, one of the things I will do is work with the city attorney to ensure that our city is filing a legal brief in opposition to SB6 if it's still on the agenda or if it comes back on the agenda uh, down the road. You know, and my, my strong support for gender equality and LGBTQ rights was one of the reasons that the Stonewall Democrats uh, decided to endorse me in this race. And I will continue that fight every day that I'm on council. And uh, there, isn't, uh, there isn't much of a, a, it pains me that our council members have not found a reason to oppose SB6 other than that it would be bad for business. The logical implication of that is that if it were good for business, it would be okay. I have taken a clear moral stance on this. I don't care whether it's good for business or bad for business. We should have to accept everybody and allow anyone Thank to you. contribute their talents here in San Antonio. <coughs> Mr. Trevino. Thank you. Um, that's factually incorrect. Uh, this, this city council has been a very thoughtful one and does strongly oppose SB6, uh, and I am proud to be uh, a, part of, a part of that group. Uh, you know, this is a compassionate, inclusive city that loves its diversity. We have a lot of great people, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, that work within our city. This isn't just one person running things. This is a whole community that is, that is really setting the great example for, for the rest of the state. And we have, we have pushed back on it. I've worked with, with our state officials on it. I've actually gone to Austin to speak against such issues. It's, uh, it's certainly important. And the NDO was, was born in District 1, and it will be cha continue to be championed in, in District 1. Uh, this is an important subject for all of us. It's, it's about true equality and in and, and the, and the spirit of who we are here in San Antonio. Thank you. All right, the next question is gonna start with Mr. Faria. So there are six propositions on the 2017 bond issue. If you had to vote to no, no, vote no on one, which one would you choose and why? And the questionnaire has asked that you cannot say none. You must pick one. Uh, infrastructure. And the reason why is because uh, it is egregiously unfair to our district. You know, we talk about um, $200 million, just about a quarter of the bond coming to District 1. If you look at overall the amount of uh, streets and sidewalks coming, it's only 8%. If you look at some of the larger projects, uh, $42 million for Broadway redevelopment. Not a lot of people in District 1 could afford the type of housing that they're building on Broadway. Again, we have a city of working people who are subsidizing a bond that they will not benefit from. $42 million for Broadway, $8 million for Fredericksburg Road. One side is working class, the other side is looking to build $500,000 condos. I believe if we want a fair and just and equitable city, we need to reinvest in our communities that have been faithfully paying their taxes and being part of the city for decades, if not generations. Thank you. Mr. Montagne. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry to disappoint the questioner, but I have to, I have to, I have to reject the premise. Uh, I'm happy to talk about specific projects within the bond, though, that are, that are problematic. Um, it is, as Mr. Fedio pointed out, disappointing that only 8% of the streets part of the bond is coming to District 1. That's not sufficient to overcome the historical lag in District 1. Um, and it, it will be claimed that 25% of the bond is coming to District 1. Of that 25, 15% is citywide projects that don't benefit many of the people in the district, like the Hemisphere Park Hotel, uh, for example. Uh, and we need to do better. We need to do more to bring real infrastructure to District 1 to fix the many problems we have on streets just like the one outside. Uh, and there are other projects, of course, in there that are uh, boondoggles that should have been avoided in this process. What we need to go back to is participation and civic engagement. It's not enough to start a conversation with the public six months before a bond proposal gets finalized. We need to start 18 months out and have real discussions that are transcribed, run according to proper procedure, and are televised for all to see. <laughs> Mr. Trevino. Uh, once again, uh, inaccurate because uh, this project, these things do 
come at us for many years uh, before we get to the bond. That's what transportation capital improvements and other departments compile a list that is, that is ongoing. Well, they, their job is to make sure that there's so many things that might be on the list preliminarily. But then we also have to develop a committee, a committee that is made up of 150 folks to help really discover exactly how we're going to spend that money in the $850 million bond, which, by the way, it's not 25%, it's 26% for, for District 1. Uh, I think it's important to also point out that, that, that the District 1 has the oldest infrastructure in the entire city, and we're addressing some very, very important key issues throughout our entire city, some of which have significant cultural and historical impact, which is why they're called citywide, because they actually have a huge, huge return on our culture, on our investments. They are making a big impact, and we are making the biggest impact on sidewalks in the history of District 1, in the history of the city, for that matter. Mr. Bustamante. Uh, the problem I see with the bond proposal is that we have needs and we have wants in those proposals. We should focus on the needs and we should put the wants aside. Uh, there's many projects that we need sidewalks, uh, streets that need to be fixed, uh, flood control, uh, that needs to be fixed. There, there's a lot of needs in the bonds which are good, but we need to, when there's a lot of wants, and there's a lot of waste in the bonds that were just tacked on by uh, interest groups. So. The, the bottom line is that you need to study those bond proposals and you need to see what is needed and what is waste and vote against the waste. And uh, it's, 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 it's all up to the people. They, they, one person can't do it. The uh, uh, smart city concept starts with the people, then goes to the community, and then they have a voice in everything. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is going to start with Mr. Montaigne. What plans do you have to tackle intertwined issues of unemployment, high school dropouts, teenage pregnancy, and child abuse in the city? That's a, <laughs> that's a bundle of terrible things. Um, look, the city can do some things to help education, and very often, you know, these, uh, these issues are all related to education and, and, and the status of our, of our working families in this city. So, the city has a new, a new, a new Cast Tech school that's starting here in the city. The city's put some money into startup for that school. Uh, one of the things that I've experienced certainly in the technology industry is that it's an industry that is very inhospitable to women. Uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, women earn 81 cents on the dollar in this country. Uh, in Texas, it's 65 cents, and for Latinas, it's 44 cents in San Antonio. So we need to do everything possible to help recruit girls through programs like, like Girls Inc into those schools to help break that cycle of uh, in, in access to jobs and to poverty. Thank you, sir. Mr. Trevino. Thank you. And this is a complex question, uh, but I'm gonna start off with what I think is an important one, which is we must address uh, the homeless population. A large part of our homeless population are battered women with children. And, and it is those folks that are actually impacted in a very negative way, and if we don't address that, uh, we, we really have a very serious problem ahead of us. And I think we're doing a lot with Haven for Hope, and we want to continue to do that work, uh, pot potentially uh, working with SAPD. We have uh, the Homeless Outreach uh, Positive Encounters Group. We've got the IMPACT team. Uh, we, I work every, other, every two weeks with the uh, Department of, uh, of Human Services to address this very issue. In fact, I just visited the Battered Women's Shelter uh, and identified this as one of the most important issues families, and I would say children, are facing. We definitely want to provide them uh, great opportunities for education, but we, we need to make sure that they're safe. Mr. Bustamante. Yeah, we, we need to make our community safe for our children. Um, they have to be secure, they have to know that they can, they can go to school and they can, they can uh, learn safely and not be uh, troubled by bullying or crime in the streets. So we need to make it safe for our children. Secondly, we need to have a healthy environment for our children, clean air, clean water, a good diet, a sugar-free diet, uh, you know, get rid of the junk foods in the schools. And lastly, we need to provide jobs for them. And the way we do that is through education, education, education. We need to get on the bandwagon and get get our children started 
on a healthy, healthy living and also training for them. New York has just started a program where they offer free four-year college for their for their residents for their, for their people if they when they qualify we should have that here we should have free free Wi-Fi free education and um, and free training so they can uh, get jobs and keep jobs here and also a fifteen dollar minimum thank, thank you. you Mr. Fadier so as someone who works uh, for fighting for working people I've seen this and I also work in our school system with teachers every day. So I've seen children being left behind at the elementary school already being left behind. When you think about third grade uh, reading test scores determining the number of beds in a jailhouse, uh, it gets to be very disturbing. We're leaving our kids behind very early. Rising poverty in the city is an issue. And if we want things to change here, we need to give people good jobs. If you want to start to address the situation, give people good jobs so they're not working all the time and not able to spend time with their families, so that they have time to spend time with their kids and uh, do their homework with them. Uh, do jobs programs, more jobs training, more counseling for these kids. Make sure that all work has dignity because we can do jobs training to get people six-figure jobs, but no matter what job you have, you should be making enough to support your family and be Thank able you, to get ahead. Thank you. Mr. Trevino, you're going to get the next question. Crime is up nearly 50% in, um, in Del View neighborhood, where they're doing their part from Citizens on Patrol, Neighborhood Watch, helping businesses um, work with the homeless by getting them to sign trespass affidavits. But more must be done in support from the city council. What is your plan to help with the crime in Delview and neighborhoods like Delview? Thank you for that question. In fact, we, we were the ones that uh, provided a public safety uh, uh, meeting in which we advised them on filling out those uh, uh, affidavits for trespassing so that the police are able to, to act quickly to, to help to uh, provide all the, the necessary services we want in that area. But also know that we currently are un under a process uh, called the Violent Crime Task Force. Uh, this Violent Crime Task Force is in, in concert with five federal agencies. It is, it is making a very serious, aggressive effort to tackle the very issue uh, that we've been talking about. And we want to make sure that we're tackling violent crime. Uh, Del View is, is, is a neighborhood that has been concerned about this very issue. We held uh, many meetings about that. We're very, uh, we have a, a police chief who is proactive. We have safe officers who have uh, committed to, to, to listening to the concerns of the neighbors. And we're, we're looking for, for many, many ways to, to improve the, the safety in those Thank neighborhoods. You, and it has actually dropped quite a bit. Mr. Bustamante. I'm sorry for them having to move that microphone back and forth. We just only have one. Under the Smart City concept, everyone is involved in crime fighting. You have here one of the best tools to fight crime. You have a camera, you have video, you've got 911 accessibility. Everyone should have a, a, a smartphone. They should be made available to everybody at a reasonable cost, if not free, especially to the elderly and, and the children. Uh, secondly, they should have free Wi-Fi all over the city so they can use the internet to report crime to the police and then the police can enforce it. It, it. it comes down to the community and the people to enforce crime and to, and to stop crime in their communities. The, the police department can use state-of-the-art cameras, they can stick state-of-the-art video, uh, drones, there's all kinds of te technology out there to reduce or, or eliminate the crime. So, but the bottom line is we need to get the people active, get them involved, get the communities involved in protecting their neighborhoods. Mr. Fetier. I agree that we need to be getting our communities more involved. More community com uh, policing and outreach, making sure our neighborhood patrols are up to snuff. Uh, we also need to talk about how crime is affected by our poverty rate. When you have a 20% poverty in this city, you're going to see an increase in crime. And if we want that to drop, we can't just arrest everyone and expect that to solve our problems. Our jails are already overcrowded. Um, but what we can do in the meantime is make sure that we do have a strong community where people know their neighbors, 
They know who is in their community. They know who is trespassing in their community. And uh, they can act quickly. And I think absolutely being in touch with your safe officer, being in touch with uh, your local uh, precinct, and also making sure that you have uh, security devices at home, use your cell phone. If you are not involved in your neighborhood association or on their Facebook page or social media, you should be to make sure we're all on the Thank same you, page. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Montano. Thank you. How many folks here are on next door? So you see, you see the crime, crime rising. It's not just your perception, it's reality. Uh, in District 1, crime has gone up significantly over the past year. Aggravated assault, for example, is up 115% over the course of the, over the, over the past year. Um, and with all due respect to the councilman, I don't think that encouraging people to fill out a form is really being an advocate for the residents of Delview or any other neighborhood. So here's what I will do. I will make sure that we are getting all of the true and accurate data out of the police department and the city staff to ensure that we can at least have a real conversation about the reality of rising crime in our neighborhood and then work with community-based organizations to move things back in the right direction. No one should feel unsafe at night. At the very least, as a resident of the city, you should be able to go to bed and not worry uh, about your safety or the safety of your children or parents. Thank you, sir. Uh, Adrian Flores is also running for city council. He's just come, so we're just gonna take a, a quick minute to kind of move everybody down here. Good. what so, was the question? Uh, the question is... Adrian, the question is, crime is up nearly 50% in the Delview neighborhood, and the neighbors are doing their part from citizens on patrol, neighborhood watch, working with businesses to remain the homeless problem by asking business owners to sign a trespass affidavit. But more must be done to support um, from the city council. What would your plan do to help reduce crime in Delview and neighborhoods like it? Um. Well, re really, the crime is up everywhere. Delby Park, what, what I understand the problem is those apartments at the end, the ones that they pay by month, um, those bring in all kinds of people. Uh, I got a lot of friends that live there in Delby Park, and I've asked them about the crime, and it's mostly a lot of people that live there that, that, um, that, that are problem with the crime. But if I'm more correctly, the times that I've been um, campaigning through the Delby Park, I haven't seen really that many policemen. So to increase our, our, our number of policemen, I don't know if that's going to be the solution or to rearrange them and put them in the, in the areas where there's a lot of crime. But um, I think we still do need more policemen, <coughs> but the best people that are going to take care of your neighborhood is, is us. I mean, in, in my neighborhood, we're always watching out. I, I live in, in, uh, in Alta Vista. We're always looking out, but I understand that Monte Vista has, you, has a lot. Okay. Um, Adrian, I'm gonna, you're going to just take this next question. Okay. What will your three priorities be for District 1? Three things. Um, infrastructure, uh, the, the declining of the, the infrastructure, the clay, the clay sewage that we have, um, the drainage, um, pipes that need to be bigger. To, to be able to get the water off the street and down into the ground. Um, certainly the, the crime rate has really gone up in, in District 1. Uh, the, the homeless uh, situation is really, really close to me because I've almost ran over four different people down on San Pedro Street. And, um, and I've gone to neighborhood associations and uh, the policemen said, well, you're, you're better off here now. They, we moved them out. So, so, they shoot them away from certain areas, but they go somewhere else. So I think there's need to be a place to where we could take them and evaluate them. And I don't really think that the state hospital has been picking up a lot of these people. There, there's five different kinds of homeless people. There's, there's people on drugs. There's people mentally ill. There's, there's a. Uh, um, 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 Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Bustamante, three priorities for District One. Three, three priorities are security. We need to have our community secure. We need to feel safe downtown in our homes and our children need to be safe in their schools. We need to get the drugs off the street. That's a priority. Second priority is health. We need to have clean air. 
less pollution, we have to have clean water, we can't be afraid of sewers busting and polluting our waters, we need, we need good health. Lastly, we need good jobs for our community, for our children, and we need good training for them. We need free education, we need free health care, for health care for everybody, we need free Wi-Fi for everybody, and everybody should, should be allowed to carry one of these, either free or at a reduced price. Uh, this, this is what other communities have done and other, other cities have done under the smart city concept, and we need to group with them and learn from them and apply what's been working in their cities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Freya, three priorities for beautiful District 1. Um, first thing I would say would be uh, infrastructure, making sure that infrastructure is coming to our neighborhoods that have, uh, are long overdue for it, whether it's streets, <laughs> sidewalks, street lights. Uh, we should not be asking our citizens to pay property taxes and then asking them to fix their sidewalks, uh, put up a street light on their own. I've never lived in a city that's asked its residents to do that. Um, we need to make sure development that is coming in is sustainable. We need to make sure that property taxes, number two, are not rising up and displacing our residents. So making sure we have proper exemptions, abatements, whether they for people of certain economic class or people who have lived in neighborhoods for a long time, to make sure and making sure people know how to fight their taxes properly if they do go up. Third is economic justice and employment, making sure people can make a living wage in the city, they can be employed. Making sure we have good wages means we have a good, robust economy year-round. Thank you. Mr. Montagna, three priorities for District 1. Sure, I always divide the priorities into sort of three buckets, right? There's the, there's the basics, the nuts and bolts we need to fix. We obviously need to invest more in infrastructure in District 1, as well as beat back the tide of rising crime. But related to that really is putting neighborhoods first. Uh, and that's not something we've seen over the past couple of years. We have many neighborhoods in this district that are rapidly changing. And what you have are single family homes that are soon being towered over by three and four story uh, multifamily units immediately adjacent. I am all for development if it makes community. I am absolutely opposed to development that breaks community. And right now the communication process between city council and neighborhoods has broken down so much that the kinds of developments that break community are being fast tracked uh, and neighborhoods are being, are being left to fend for themselves. That's not right, and it's, I think we deserve more from our, from our city council. Mr. Trevino, three priorities for District 1. Thank you. I'm going to talk as fast as I can. Okay, public safety, that's uh, certainly very important, and that's why we invested $21.5 million towards a new central substation that's going to be at the heart of District 1. I think it's going to provide incredible opportunities for all of us. Infrastructure is another big piece. Again, we're investing more than any other time in infrastructure in District 1 it is the oldest infrastructure in the entire city and therefore, again, a committee process agreed with this kind of investments. We're doing some amazing things. We've never invested more in sidewalks than we ever have. In fact, only $13 million were invested in the previous bond. This year we have up to $85 million invested citywide, $10 million just in District 1. Lastly, I want to say, we want people to age in place. The, 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 the issue of our, of, of our time is, is our aging population, and I want to work hard to allow people to stay in their homes for as long as they wish to live. They, they, they're people that have been in their homes for 50 years and want to live out the rest of their lives in those homes, and I have provided programs to actually help them do just that. Thank you, sir. Adrian, did you start? No. Okay. No. Um, yes, he did. He did. He started, and then we came to Bismarck. Okay, let's go. You've answered the question three priorities. Yeah, I think I did. You did. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting lost. Uh, it's my it's my boo boo. Okay. Um, so then, Mr. Bustamante is starting now. Yes. Okay. Several several neighborhoods in District One suffer from bad drainage, deteriorating infrastructure, and poor lighting. Um, what is your plan to correct these problems while saving taxpayer money? And please be very specific. Okay. Again, we need to look at the needs. If if a street light is needed, then it needs to put be put in. There. We have uh, some access lighting or some projects that that, uh, that don't take priority. We need to, to uh, get get the needs taken care of. And uh, and and how is how do we do that? Is is through the people. The people have to call in. They have to uh, dial uh, 311. They have to call 
you know, come into city council. You have to, people have to get involved. People get involved, things get done. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So this, the, so the, so the <laughs> drainage problems and the poor lighting needs to be reported. And then once it's reported, then it's put on a need basis as a priority, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a must. And then, and then it's up to us to get it done quickly. <coughs> Mr. Fergie. We absolutely need to have communities that are strongly organized to address these issues. Um, I, as city council person, I would fight to repeal the municipal code that requires people to pay for things like sidewalk repairs, fight to make sure that CPS is not requiring people to pay money just to feel like they have a safe street. Um, we need to invest more in our infrastructure. We need to develop our communities so that they know if they call the city, we are gonna be responsive to their requests and not put them on hold or uh, wait too long. You know, That's why we have neighborhoods that are falling behind with uh, streets that are flooding, I got sidewalks that are so bad that people can't even um, take a stroller down them or if you're in a wheelchair. So make sure our communities actually can get a response from the city, we need a responsive person in there. Someone who is a working class candidate who knows what it's like to be in those communities. So I will advocate for you as city council person. Thank you, sir. Mr. Montagno. Sure, well, you know, as I, as I sort of stated earlier, we, we are not investing enough in the current bond in streets and infrastructure. And if it were up to me, you know, we would have peeled back some of that money from you know, the millions and millions of dollars we're giving away to hotel operators and construction companies that don't even come with good paying union jobs. Uh, and I would invest it back in the neighborhoods. You look at a place like Los Angeles Heights or Alta Vista, you have places that don't even have curbs, much less sidewalks. Now, I know some folks from the Rio Grande Valley, the, the councilman's uh, original home, home part of the world, and people, they tell me, hey, they, they've got better streets and sidewalks than we do here in San Antonio. As we approach our, our tricentennial, I think that's completely unacceptable. Um, and that goes for, you know, for drainage as well. As for lighting, we definitely need to expand lighting. You know, I heard from some members of the Texas Organizing Project, which endorsed me today, uh, that they asked for more lighting in their corner of the west side, which is part of District 1 in 78207, and they were told it would be bad for them because light is not great for people when, at night. That may or may not be true. What I know is when the residents of your Thank district you, are asking for your support, you owe it to them. Thank you. Mr. Trevino. Lighting is good, um, especially when it's the appropriate kind of lighting. But let me go back. First thing, drainage. Uh, low impact development projects, uh, which we help fund uh, some dollars to, to help pilot some programs on, on doing better research and innovation on the impact that development has uh, upstream from us. That's why we're having to deal with a lot of drainage issues in District 1. We're downstream from a lot of issues. The Barber Drainage Project is a huge one. It's the Phase 2 is in, in, in the bond and is a very important piece. Drainage is a huge, huge issue in District 1. We're tackling it, and we want to do it in a very thoughtful and, and, and meaningful way. Lighting. <clears throat> uh, there's a term called biophilia. <clears throat> and the reality is we're replacing all our street lights with LED lights, which is more energy efficient, but nobody ever thought to think that that particular LED light may or may not be the most appropriate light. CPS agrees with me. We're changing all the lights in, in, in District 1 to be the more uh, appropriate kind of light. It's a, it's a warmer light, 3500 Kelvin or, or, or below. Thank you, sir. And CPS is incredibly supportive of that. Mr. Flores. Um, the, the following was, um, it, it, I think we're doing pretty good with the project that, that happened on St. Cloud and Mistletoe. You know, we, we, you all need that in Delview Park also with your dry creek, drainage creek that you have. It needs, it needs to be redone, just like the one that, that was on the Woodlawn project. <laughs> That was a real good project. I just didn't like the chain link fence that looks really shiny if you walk outside and you drive by it. But um, the the drainage rules in San Antonio are, are are in particular to District One because, like you said, you know we're downstream from a lot of the parking lots, like um, um, the the shopping centers. So pavement on the street makes flooding. It it it, it creates flooding. So I think we've been doing a pretty good job. You know, we keep doing projects like the one on St. Cloud and, and Mistletoe. The, the Woodlawn project was really good. So I think we need to do more of that. We used to experience a significant stray dog problem. 
More than 3,600 citizens were bitten or mauled by dogs in 2016. Some of these attacks have caused serious in injuries to citizens, resulting in significant costs to the taxpayers at University Hospital. How would you tackle the public safety issue of dogs? Uh, we definitely need to reduce our stray population. I was bit um, about two years ago by a dog who was not chained up. So uh, I'm very familiar with it. I still get apprehensive sometimes being around dogs that are not chained up. So I know what it's like. Um, you know, if we want to address this issue, one, we need more animal control services. So we need, and we see rising property taxes, so we should be seeing a rise in our city services. We have not. That's an issue. Two, we need to teach education. We need to teach responsible pet ownership. So from the time when you are a small child, we should be partnering in education because children do not want to give up their pets. Families will listen to a child and try not to give up a pet. So let's teach them to make sure their, their dogs are locked up, that they spay and neuter, that we support spay and neuter clinics like uh, the Cannoli Fund and others. That's how we're gonna get the stray population down. Thank you, sir. Mr. Montana. Uh, I absolutely agree that education is a, is a component of how we treat this issue in San Antonio. Uh, it's worse in some parts of town than others. Uh, some people may not have uh, all, the, all the things they need to care, properly care for the animals, so education is a part of it. I think realistically, we also need to revisit our, our no-kill policy. Now, that policy was developed with a very uh, humanitarian impulse, <laughs> and that is very much to be, to be praised, that, that, that empathy with, with other creatures that walk on this earth with us. Uh, the thing that we didn't anticipate, perhaps, is that the real consequence is that in order to achieve no kill, we're either releasing dangerous dogs, or we're just not picking them up in the first place. And, and, and my view is that we need to have uh, compassion, of course, but we also need to make sure that we have compassion for the people who are potentially being bitten and harassed by these dogs. And that may mean uh, moving to a more modified uh, no-kill or quasi-no-kill policy for our shelters. Let's not fudge the numbers. Let's really, let's really address the full scope of the problem with Thank the full you. light of day. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Trevino, how do you feel about dogs? I love dogs. And compassion is at the heart of an ordinance that I, that I wrote. And uh, it is about tethering dogs. And uh, it's a te tethering ordinance. And, it's, and it means that we take a closer look at how animals are treated. Uh, there's a, a, a statistic that I, that I learned from ACS was that over 90% of the dogs that, that are aggressive or bite people are usually tethered of some kind, in some way. And so this is an important issue. We're learning in many ways how we can educate the community. Just know that there's actually a process going on right now that uh, ACS is looking to get more feedback, more input. We want to grow exactly uh, how, what, how we can improve our services. Uh, and, and I believe that uh, there's, there's many ways to, to find a compassionate way. Uh, of course, I was very supportive of Pets Alive taking over the, the facilities over uh, near, the, near the zoo. And it's a very important piece uh, of, of our city. Thank you, sir. Mr. Flores on dogs. Um, I think people need to be educated, like the other um, candidate said. Um, people need to be responsible with their pets. Uh, I think that's the biggest problem is, is people being responsible about keeping dogs and cats. Um, I don't know about my neighborhood or not that way, so somebody's been catching the dogs and the cats, and I don't see that many stray dogs and cats anymore. Um, but the, my rodent population has gone up, so I got more skunks and more. Uh, um, so there's some pounds there. I mean, the cats were there for the, the, my, the rats and stuff, um, but people. We really need to educate people on how to keep animals. Uh, as far as vicious dogs, people turn dogs into vicious dogs. Dogs are not born vicious. Um, so education, I think, for, for the animals, I think it's, it, it's the most thing that we could do. Mr. Bustamante, on dogs. Well, neutering is a solution to, uh, to decrease the dog population. But <laughs> the worst thing we've got are children, and they love these dogs, and they just have to have a dog, but they can't take care of them. So I, you know, I've been there, done it, I've got the trophies. So uh, it, it, it's gonna be up to the people. I mean, again, you know, you've got to report, uh, you know, the, the, the wild dogs, you need to call it in, 
and it has to be a need, you know, where the, where the city comes out immediately and picks up these dogs. Again, you do it by taking pictures, video, you know, sending it in, texting it in, and calling 311. Uh, and, and also, you need to report, you know, abusive dogs. You know, some, a lot of people are abusing their animals, and I mean, that's, that's just wrong. They, you know, no animal needs to be abused, so you need, you know, we need to have some enforcement as far as the, the abuse of animals. But it, it, it comes down to the people. We, we need to step up and, and report it. And, um, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now would be a great time for some kind of joke, but I think I've already settled my jokes tonight. Mr. Montanier, you're going to get the next question. Uh, in changing the tone of what we're talking about, how does your background lend itself to making sure our neighborhoods are heard and respected on the city council? Well, sure. Um, thank you for the question. Look, I was born and raised here. I grew up on the southwest side of the town near, near Kelly Air Force Base, uh, very near where my grandmother lived, just a few, about a mile away. And uh, I have seen what it means to be, to be neglected in the city, and I think a lot of people in this district are feeling that right now. Uh, I also think that a, a background in law, frankly, is a, is a though much maligned, is a useful uh, thing for city council. If you're going to be writing laws, if you're going to be interpreting laws, if you're going to be anticipating how they might be implemented, it sure helps to, to have been trained in how to, how to write them and how to interpret them, because uh, that's exactly what you're going to be doing a lot of the time. You know, I've also uh, spent time in, uh, I worked for Mayor Castro on uh, energy policy, and I helped uh, then Mayor Castro pass pre-K for SA. So I have seen all the different sides of how to move uh, policy forward in our city, uh, and I <laughs> intend to continue doing that in a, in a, in a progressive uh, way once, once I'm on council. Thank you, sir. Mr. Trevino. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I'm an architect, and as one of the first architects on city council, I think I provide a very unique set of skills. And when we talk about diversity, we should think about diversity of thought, diversity of ideas. And I think I can, I provide that. In fact, the, that's my record. I'm simply, simply going to run on my record. Uh, the, the many programs and things that I've endorsed and, and pushed have been about just that. Uh, I like to think that we're not necessarily creating laws, we're building communities. And, and that's really important. To, to understand exactly how that happens is very, very important. This city is, is really uh, a, large, a large city that is, that is growing. Uh, understanding how those, those, all those things uh, come into place and work together is very, very important. I'm the only one who can truly understand that. Uh, quite frankly, I feel that uh, my services on city council have been utilized in that very way to provide a very diverse perspective. I myself grew up, by, uh, was raised by a single mother. I understand what it is to be disadvantaged. I understand what it is to, be, to feel excluded. I wasn't born here, but I choose to live here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Flores. What's the question again? The question is, how does your background lend itself to making sure our neighborhoods are heard and respected on the city council? Well, first of all, I've, I've lived uh, in Alta Vista for 43 years. Uh, we own property in Alta Vista and Beacon Hill, uh, rental properties. So my inheritance sits here. So, yeah, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to fight for it. And I'm going to fight for y'all's tax dollars to make sure that the right thing goes is done with our, our tax dollars. Um, there's something, uh, Mr. Trevino, it's called responsible growth. And I understand about um, growth, but there's also be something responsible growth that the project on Craig Street, and I, that was totally irresponsible. Either you let it go up or somebody dropped the ball somewhere along the way. But that's not conserving our neighborhoods. And, and we've talked, to, you know, your staffers have talked about conserving their neighborhood. How is that conserving our neighborhood? You know, there's older ladies that go to uh, the code compliance comes down where you have to paint your house, do this to force them to move their, their to sell their houses. Okay, so we're going to be nitpicking about people that have been living there for 50, 60 Thank years. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bustamante, how does your background lend itself to making sure our neighborhoods are heard and respected on the city council? I've practiced law here in San Antonio for some 35 years. I've lived in every part of the city, the south side, the north side, east side, west side. I live downtown now. I'm very familiar with the city. Um, I have a beautiful wife, been happily married. I have 10 children. I've uh, raised my children in this, in, in this city, in the schools. I'm familiar with the, with the schools. I have a doctorate 
in law, uh, have a law license, I'm a practicing lawyer. I've, I've been to San Antonio College, uh, UT at Austin, University of Houston, and also uh, University of North Texas up in Dallas. Uh, very familiar with, uh, with the system. Um, I was elected to the Edwards Aquifer Authority. I was an elected official for four years. Uh, I know I know what this city needs. I'm familiar with the with the smart city concept, and the key is. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pettyev, how does your background lend itself to making sure our neighborhoods are heard and respected on the city council? Look, a lot of people run for city council because they think that they've got the best policy ideas or that they've got the best educational background or whatever, and they say, okay, well, I'm going to solve all the problems for you all. That's not how this works. We need more people involved. I have my job as a labor and community organizer, which I've done for seven years, is to empower other people to take action. We've talked a lot about having our neighborhoods and communities involved. But it's not easy to do that. It's not easy to just say people should get involved, otherwise we'd have 100% voter turnout. This is a city that's historically disenfranchised. If we want to change anything in this city, let's advocate for having someone in office that actually represents and knows what working people uh, are all about. I've traveled around a lot in my life. I'm not from San Antonio, but I chose it because I love it. I chose it because it's a working class city, and I believe that through my experience and what I've seen elsewhere with developer-driven gentrification, I will be a good advocate because I know Thank what's you, coming. Sir. Thank you. Mr. Trevino, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about guns. With the state open carry law, how does a city like San Antonio stop shootings that we now see on local news and next door all the time? Well, you know, when that, when that came out, um, you know, City Hall went through a transformation, which I don't uh, uh, enjoy because there's extra security measures that we had to employ. Uh, there's now literally gun lockers uh, for, for those people because uh, the, the state law that they can bring those, those, those things into City Hall. Um, the reality is, <clears throat> this is something that we all have to work on together. We are, we are piloting a program called Shot Spotter. And it is a program that we, we've piloted, piloted, piloted in uh, Districts 1 and Districts 2. Uh, and it is, it is using technology, as, as was said with Mr. Bustamante before, about how, to, how can we use some of that uh, technology to help us. The reality is, though, with that technology, we still need the community to support, the community to, to, to be involved. SAPD, once they get the call, they, 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 they begin to work. They need people, the, the community, to, to, to help us with some of the leads, and that's how we truly catch people who are uh, using Thank you, guns sir. illegally. Mr. Flores on the guns. Uh, <laughs> the first cowboy rule for, for owning a gun is don't get shot by your own gun. Okay? People need to be more responsible about their guns. I, I'm all for people who want to have a gun you know, to protect themselves, protect their family, they live in a bad area, whatever. Or they live on the country, they want to shoot the gun, whatever. But people need to start being responsible about taking care of their gun, putting you know, uh, locks on it, put it in a, in a safe. Um, I think there ought to be tougher laws for people that don't do that. Um, everybody should have a gun safe, you know? Either have as many guns as you have. Uh, in this country, there's six guns to every adult. Um, and, um, and if they made bullets, more expensive and people won't be just shooting around with them. <laughs> All right. Mr. Bustamante, on open carrying and shootings. Uh, we're we're, we're going to have guns and there's no, we can't stop people from having guns. But we can enforce the laws, we can, we can help control it. <laughs> I think if, if people that carry guns knew that they were being videotaped or they were being on, on, on some type of surveillance, then they'd be a little bit hesitant to use their weapon or they'd be a little bit more careful. Uh, again, that subject is really going to boil down to getting people involved in stopping uh, uh, shootings, you know, getting them involved in controlling their communities and reporting crime and getting the, the policemen out there as quick as they can to 
to enforce it. I mean, there's all kinds of technologies that can make our community safe. We need to start uh, uh, putting them in communities that really need them. Thank you. Mr. Fedia, on guns and shootings. Uh, well, I think there's several different issues with um, shootings happening. You know, is it accidental? Is it intentional? Is it a home invasion? What, what kind of, are we trying to address here? Uh, one way we can cut back on uh, shootings is teaching responsible gun ownership, making sure that people do lock up their weapons. My father had uh, two handguns when I was growing up, and both of them, over the course of our lives, got stolen at some point or another. Someone came into our house, someone broke into his car. So those are now two guns that ended up out on the street somewhere. And that's a, that's a serious issue, right? If we're trying to make sure that we have accountability, we should make sure we teach responsible ownership for it. Uh, we should teach more gun safety, and we should also be, we want to eliminate uh, shootings in our neighborhoods that are accidental. We should make sure we know who's in our communities and uh, make sure that no one who is uh, not supposed to be there is um, a threat. Thank you. Mr. Montana. Thank you. Um, I'm a hunter. I hunt every winter. I own a, I own a handgun, own a couple of rifles. Uh, but there is, there is a, a place and time for that, and it's not on a person's hip. And I say that with uh, some passion because I know something about gun violence. There were three people murdered on my block uh, with handguns when I was a kid on the south side. And my, my dear aunt, my, mother's, my grandmother's daughter, was shot and killed in a bar fight. So it is deeply important to me. And I will do everything in my power to prevent gun violence in the city. That being said, Shot Spotter is the kind of program that only a contractor could love. It doesn't work, and it's not the kind of thing that the police officers are asking for or need. And I know that because San Antonio Police Officers Association members met with me in a group and told me so. Uh, we need to stop foisting uh, pet projects upon our city departments, including the police department, and really focus on the things that are proven to work. And we need to listen, once again, uh, to those who are in the line of fire and who know exactly what Thank those you, tools are. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Flores, you're going to start on the next question. Oh, did Trevino not start? Do I still owe you an answer? He started. He started. Mr. Trevino, or, sorry, Mr. Flores, you're going to get the next question. Away from guns, let's talk about money. Also a very serious topic, right? Um, for years, the uh, city government has been criticized for the exorbitant salaries of the city managers and the city executives. Um, what do you think about that? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's gotten out of hand. The, the, the pay raise that Jim Scully have, has really gone out of hand. The reason it got out of hand is because for a long time we didn't pay our councilmen. So one way or the other, they're, they were going to make money somewhere underneath the table. I mean, that was just common practice. But now we're paying the city councilmen, and um, that mentality needs to change. Um, I would work for whatever they pay me, and I wouldn't take money from anybody. I mean, I would be stealing from myself, I would be stealing from my neighbors, and the people that I went to school with. Um, Scully's pay raises, uh, uh, she's, she's the one that dictates in, in the city hall instead of the city hall dictating her. Um, when somebody makes more money than you, she don't work for you. Okay? So, it, it's, it's totally responsible. It, it, it just needs to be changed. The, the, the culture Thank needs you, to be sir. changed. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bustamante, your feelings on salaries at City Hall? There needs to be accountability and transparency. Uh, uh, it, the simple rule is if you follow the money, you'll find, you know, whether it's been spent wisely and prudently or if it's been wasted or comes from corruption. So uh, having a, a, an accountability and a transparent system where we know where all the dollars are going, who's getting it, why they're getting it, and then, and then the people should really vote on it as to whether they should, they should receive a high salary, whether they're worth it or not. And uh, they voted on the city council uh, salaries. They should vote on the city manager's salary, the mayor's salary, and everybody else's salary. There, there needs to be uh, 
accountability and transparency, and again, through the, a good um, smart city program that can be done over the internet. Thank you. Mr. Fadia, on salaries at City Hall. I think there absolutely needs to be more accountability in our city. Uh, this is a city that is a city manager heavy form of government, which uh, contributes to lack of accountability, decisions being made behind closed doors, more city staffers rather than elected officials uh, making decisions, and that's very problematic. Uh, it comes from our history of not having a city council that was strong, having city council that was part-time. The only people who could afford to be city council members were business people who then funneled that money back to their own communities and their own businesses. Uh, most people in this city remember a time where it was very hard for them to vote, that there were severe voter restrictions against them. So of course, we have a city now that has low voter turnout, low civic engagement. We want that to change. We need real people on city council. I am someone who has never taken a dime from special interests uh, or big business. My campaign has totally been grassroots, regular people powered, and that's how it will be on city council. That's what we need if we want the city to change, and I believe in taking away the power from Cheryl, Cheryl Scully and making the city a city Thank of you, the sir. people. Mr. Montagno. Oh, I, I have to say that, that, and this isn't directed at anyone on the table, um, that sometimes I feel like our critiques in this city uh, of Ms. Scully tend to take a bit of a sexist tone. Uh, that's unfortunate, uh, but it may be a part of uh, a reality of, of the discussion. So uh, my critiques are not directed at, uh, at Ms. Scully. I think that we have to think carefully about whether we want to be a city with a, a strong manager, weak council system, or we want to grow up and do what most other cities of our, of our size around the country have done, which is move to a strong mayor system where democratic accountability can actually be held by the residents of the city. Because if you don't like the direction of your city, you can vote out the person who's actually the chief administrator, and that's the mayor. Um, in the meantime, we need to think smartly about how we start that conversation with the rest of San Antonio, and how we properly align the incentives of city staff, so that they're focused on the right things, not just job growth, for example, but high quality job growth. Mr. Trevino. Thank you. And not a new idea because uh, we're actually having that discussion right now. Uh, quite frankly, it is important for us to, to reevaluate. We're, we're, we're a much bigger city than we ever were, and we are taking a look at the, the structure of our city and to see how important that is. But to address the actual issue of pay that I don't believe was answered, which is really, uh, quite frankly, the, the city council is now looking at, uh, through a transparent process, performance pay for our city manager. And that's really important. The reality is we, we, she, she manages a $2.2 .2 billion budget. We have executive staff that have huge responsibility uh, throughout our city. And I think it's important to recognize uh, how, how, to, how to help manage that. So uh, we are addressing both those very issues uh, right now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bustamante, I have finished with the questions from Alice. I'm gonna ask you one question about why you're running when I ran for the city council in this seat almost 10 years ago, I ran on lead paint, lead paint flakes being it, eaten by a young child at the end of my street. And I was really worried about that. Each of you have a reason why you've chosen to run as you get a chance to share a vision with these neighbors and their families. Why did you run for the city council? Uh, I chose to run because my experience has, has taught me a lot, I've, I've done a lot of research, I've traveled a lot, I've had a lot of clients, I know the people in San Antonio, and I know that we can be a lot better than what we are. And I know this because under the smart city concept, there's so much technology and there's so much knowledge out there that we can draw from. Under the open source concept, we can draw this, all these ideas and make our community one of the smartest cities in, in Texas and in, in San Antonio. Now, we're not the only ones that are doing this. There's other cities that are doing this also, and they're being very successful. If, if somebody in China has, a, has an idea that can benefit us, then we can take that idea and we can apply it and make, make San Antonio and make District 1 the smartest district in the, in the city. And this is why I'm running, is to, is to automate San Antonio and get us up there to the, to the smartest city in, in the state. Thank you. Mr. Padilla. 
You know, ever since I've been in San Antonio, I've been involved here, gone to city council meetings, and I was extremely disappointed to learn that our current city council does not care. You know, they talk about it being citizens to be heard. It's more like citizens to be ignored because people are playing on their phones, they don't show up, they're talking to each other. And, you know, whether it's the vote for the Hemisphere Park redevelopment or the big giveaways to mega corporations like Uber and Lyft coming into our city, there just has not been a lot done for the regular people here. Not even a protest vote. Even if they knew that everyone else on council was voting in favor of something, they could at least make a token to say that they stand with their constituency. That has not happened. And when I found out that there was no progressive challenger to our current city council member, I said, well, then I'm going to run because I am a working class candidate and I believe that working people should have a voice here. I have fought for working people for years and I will continue to do so as your city council member. Thank you. Mr. Montano. Thanks, Chris. Um, the reasons are pretty simple. Uh, as someone who, who grew up here and has always loved this city with all of my heart, I simply got tired of seeing working people and neighborhoods getting ignored. Uh, we have a lot of money being spent on pet projects like the very limited White Roofs program and a pair of multi-hundred thousand dollar toilets that don't really help um, a lot of people in the city. And so, when I, as, I, as I went from neighborhood association meeting to neighborhood association meeting to churches uh, and other community organizations, I heard a, a, the same refrain over and over again, which is, we are not heard. Uh, and when I think about someone like, like my grandmother and the many people like her who are being pushed out of their homes throughout District 1 because of <clears throat> rampant uh, overdevelopment that's ill-conforming to the neighborhoods around it, uh, I just couldn't sit by and watch our city drift on inertia. Uh, without leadership from District 1, which is uniquely positioned uh, to move our city forward and to be an inclusive platform for progressive change in the city. Thank you, sir. Mr. Trevino, why are you running? Well, it was kind of an evolutionary process for me. Again, I, I have experience working in different committees. Uh, I, I represented Diego Bernal on several committees. Uh, I was also asked by Julian Castro to represent the city on the Bear Appraisal Board of Directors. All that being said, uh, when the uh, position of a dub, Diego Bernal said, you really should think about this. You provide a very unique and diverse perspective. Um, I find it funny that a lawyer is going to call a, a roof project that actually helps lower utility bills for seniors a pet project. I mean, this is about compassion. And I think one of the very reasons that people wanted me to run and wanted me to be a part of this is because they understand my connection to the community and my compassion for my city. I've lived here almost 20 years and I understand my city and I think that this is part of the reason why I want to be a part of city council, to help direct things in such a way that the that, that projects are compassionate, are inclusive, and are very thoughtful, thoughtfully designed. Mr. Flores, why are you running? Uh, first of all, I was born, raised, and educated in District 1. Um, I went to a little school downtown called St. Mary's on the Riverwalk. I entered to St. Anthony Seminary in Monte Vista, and then later on graduated from Thomas Edison High School. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a Joskies baby. My dad worked at Joskies since I was a kid. Uh, my mom also worked downtown. So my connection to downtown has been all my life, OK? Um, things just didn't make sense anymore. Uh, like our new uh, bond that proposal, uh, things just didn't make sense to me anymore. When we're asking for a bond and we're giving away a river barge contract that's worth 44 million, we need to keep more of that revenue. Uh, there's a lot of contracts like that. Um, I mean, just just happened a month, uh, last month that they gave away that that river barge. So things like that, they just didn't make any sense. We're asking for a billion dollars when we're giving away the, Thank the, you, the revenue. We've all been here. It's been great to have you all tonight. But I don't want the program to go so long that we don't get to really think about what everybody said. So with that, gentlemen, I'm going to give you one minute to close. And then after that, we're going to thank the League of Women Voters and the neighbors for coming. Mr. Freya, your one minute. Good night. One minute. OK. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming out because this is where civic engagement starts with you all. And I hope that you will stay around after if you have any questions for me. Like I said, I, I'm someone who cares deeply about running for the city so that working people have a voice. 
And uh, I'm someone who, if elected, will not have any side jobs. I'm actually taking a, a large pay cut to do this, but I don't have a side consultancy or firm. I believe fully in that you deserve a council person who is gonna be working for you full time. I wanna be out in your neighborhoods, I wanna hear what you have to say, and I wanna empower you so that you have a voice. I want you right there alongside me, find me for justice for all people in this city. So thank you very much for coming out. Mr. Montanio. Well, again, thank you all for making this event happen. I can't think of a, of a better way to sort of round out the last bit of uh, forums that we're doing as candidates. You know, it's not easy to challenge an incumbent, but we have been doing a pretty good job so far, and that's because there is an upswell of readiness for change in District 1. And if you think about what's been happening over the course of the past couple of years, it's easy to understand why. We've talked about many of those things tonight. I just want to leave you with this. Uh, thus far in the race, I've been endorsed by the AFL-CIO, Unite Here, Stonewall Democrats, Northeast Bear County Democrats, Bear County Young Democrats, uh, Communication Workers of America, and on and on, Texas Organizing Project, SEIU. The reasons are simple. There, it is time for change. We need someone who's gonna fight and advocate for the residents of the district, not just contractors, uh, and big business and special interests. And that's why, like Mr. Fedia, I haven't taken a dime from any uh, special interests, lobbyists, or contractors for the city. Uh, and I intend to keep it that way as we go forward together as a community and conversation. You, sir. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Trevino. Most of those dimes have come from California. Um, I will say that it's important to understand that um, the reality is I'm running because I'm running on my record. Nobody up here has a record except your current council. And I want to talk about something that I think is really important to the League of Women Voters. We introduced uh, a true ethics reform for the city, uh, which included the League of Women's Voter to, to truly be a part of this and it, understanding how the city runs and how we can better connect the city, create real interconnectivity, real representation. The reality is you want a voice and there is a way to do that. There's a proper way to do that. There's folks that just, just don't know how to do that, but I'm running on my record and I ask for your, for your support and your vote. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Mr. Flores. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today and the uh, women, uh, legal women voters. Um, I'm, I'm from here and I'm going to take care of this place. Uh, I'm seeing the changes to District 1 over the years. And uh, quite frankly, you know, Mr. Tremaine, your legacy is not that great right now. Uh, if you go around to the neighborhood associations, you don't show up because you send your staffer. You won't show up. I mean, I wouldn't show up either. But transparency is, is a big, big thing for me and, and honesty. Um, when things didn't make any sense to me anymore, this is why I stepped up. Along with a lot of other fellow, fellow Democrats, we all answered the call to come and run because things just didn't make any more sense. When there's people starving, there's food being thrown away in our cafeterias. Uh, when a lot of things didn't make any sense, Thank you, Mr. that's why I'm here. Mr. Bustamante. I've had literally thousands of clients that I've represented, and I you know, stand in front of them, they stand behind me, and I lead them you know, into, into you know, victories and the court battles, and, and I do a, a big service for my clients. Now, as city councilman, I'll be your attorney, your representative, I'll be your leader, but I need the people to stand behind me so I can lead them, and that's what I promise to bring to the, to the office. Good leadership, good knowledge, legal experience, uh, political experience. I've been on many boards, I have many records that I can talk all night about. Uh, you know, the bottom line is I'm here to represent the people. I've done it all my life, and I can do it for you. And I'm going to be an advocate for free internet, free health care for everybody, free schools for everybody. We can afford it. Other cities have done it. We need to do it. Thank you. These five people are looking for a vote, and I hope you've listened to them carefully tonight. And if you have some questions, 
They're going to be just over here by the door, and I encourage you to visit with them and get honest answers to real questions that affect your neighbors and their families on behalf of the League of Women Voters for the San Antonio area. We appreciate all of you coming out. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause and good night.